Okay, welcome to this, my new editing series on tips and tools for architecture and interior photography with a fine art approach. Of course, it's a fine art approach because that's what we do here on this channel. Well, in part one, we're gonna be kind of using primarily Adobe Lightroom, and that's the software that I always use. In part one, we're gonna be kind of giving you tips and tools to be able to kind of guide you through what I do with interior and architecture photography. I'm not saying that all of these tools cannot be used in other genres, they probably can, and you'll know some of them, and you definitely will not know some others. In part two, we're gonna be using Lightroom and jumping images into Photoshop to use advanced straightening tools, focus stacking that can only be done in Photoshop. We will also look at creating HDR files, blending images together, creating HDR panoramics, and more in multiple software platforms. In part three, we're gonna primarily use my new presets. We're gonna show you those. We're gonna kind of guide you through Luminar Neo, how it works, and we're gonna sit down and do a full edit together. So before I dive into part one, there is a few things I just wanna go over, and that comes in terms of hardware. I'm normally using a monitor. Now I'm based in Turkey, and monitors are incredibly expensive, all tech is, and because of it's expensive, it's limited. People don't buy it, it's a kind of, a, you know, that sort of economy. So I went for the best I could afford at the time. Um, it's just a mid-range LG monitor, but it is IPS which is important, and it is 4K. So it's not the best of the best. I could recommend you some uh, monitors, and I would probably say a BenQ one would be better than this, but it's good and important to have one. This is a 27 inch. Next up, I have a laptop. I'm always using a laptop. When I was on the Rode Remote, which of course I did in the past, um, that was primarily what I used, but it's always better, of course, to have uh, a monitor and use that when editing. It's just easier to guide yourself around. In this video, part one, I'm only going to be using a mouse, just a basic normal mouse. It's fairly large for my hand. But in part two, I will introduce you to graphics tablets as well. So that's pretty much it. Let's dive in to Adobe Lightroom and start this session. Okay, so we're going to move through Adobe Lightroom then. And I've set this huge catalog up for you so that I can do exactly that. Quick pointers then, let's move in. So firstly, I'm always looking, you know, I've got a huge catalog when I first get back from a trip. And of course, I need to go through and mark up which images to get rid of and which not. I use a combination of flags and color labels, but primarily color labels. Now, how I use that is yellow for blended photos like HDRs and green for well, complete, finished, ready to export. When you start to basically look at this panel, if you right click on the panel, you can see here, you've actually got solo mode. Now this is currently not activated. And that means when we come through here and we open this, we open this, we open all of these things, you have to scroll through basically absolutely everything to get to what you want. If we click solo mode, what happens is when you go into another one, it closes the previous and that makes things a lot easier to kind of navigate through. The next one that I use quite a lot, especially for printing is uh, using lights out mode. Now you do that and you access it by pressing a keyboard shortcut of L to get to show you this view. And you can actually make it bigger by uh, closing these arrows and actually making it so you can see the full image on the screen. That's great if you're ever printing your images to check everything on your calibrated monitor to make sure things are good. Next one, visualizing your clipping. Now what I mean by that is up here you've got in the develop module, you've got your kind of two triangles that if you hover over them, you can actually click, and when you hover over them, it highlights blacks on the left one, and it highlights white highlights on the right one. And I always make sure that they're on, so you click them and leave them on. It then always shows you, by this kind of overlay, this highlight, which areas are very dark, too dark, or very, more importantly actually, very bright. So in other words, what's overexposed in the image. Is it by design, or is it by accident and you want to know that so if i then pulled this image up for example it would then show you with a nice overlay that these things are dark and these things in particular a bit brighter they go red red is pretty important because that then shows you this is overexposed do you want this or not so you might not want it on all the time but you can get to that on and off by just pressing this button here and that's again pretty important next one white balance now of course most people know about white balance but you'll always hear people saying, well, we can just fix it in post. That's great if you know how, and you need to know how, and it's one tool that I primarily check a lot. Here's another image. Now let's turn off those visual clipping cues just there, and when we come here, we've actually got temperature. 
Now, of course, if I go blue, this will go more of a kind of uh, light, more of a kind of gray color first and then into the blues. And then if we go yellow, it will go more of a greeny first and then eventually into the kind of yellows. And you can see that there. But what we can actually do is we can actually use this dropper tool here and we can click on something gray, a neutral target. And when you do that, it will set things to neutral. And in architecture, that is then your starting point. In fine art architecture, to be honest with you, it's kind of irrelevant. We don't really, I don't use this that often, but it's just something that people do in interiors for like commercial use. But for me, I'm usually doing this by eye. So I'm gonna move on now to dedicated architecture tips. And there is a bundle of them. And the first one is something that you should be doing all of the time, especially if you're using those wide angle lenses. Now here is a monastery that I shot in Georgia a long, long time ago, and it's just basically a raw file. Uh, it's actually a CR2, look at that, very old. So we come down here, and one of the most important things, of course, the first thing that you should always do is come in here to lens corrections and make sure that you remove your aberration and you enable your profile corrections. When you do that, it will show you that I used a 24 to 70 and it will automatically really fix for any warping or bending that's happened and barrel distortion with that lens. So look at this, you can see the instant change that it does it kind of flattens out the image and makes it actually the right kind of dimensions to what it should be and makes things look nice and straight. So we want to make sure that's on. Easy, right? Next up, we have straightening and grids. Now, this is a real simple one. It should be done before you even start any editing, really. And we talked earlier about our lens corrections. Well, underneath that, you've got transform tool. Now, this is kind of important in architecture. In fact, it's the single most important thing. Now, I actually do most of my straightening in Photoshop because I'm only tweaking. I'm getting it right mostly in camera, as I've said. Here, though, if you've got just slight tweaks, you can do it by under transform, press auto, nine times out of 10, it'll straighten up your image and get it correct. And here it has done exactly that. If you then combine that transform tool with the crop tool, like I did earlier, and use those grid overlays, you can then just check that that has done a good job and making sure that everything's straight and lined. So for example, here, I've got gold section on the left and the right. I want them to be kind of lining up exactly. So far, you probably know a lot of these, but the next one is gonna have a lot of benefit for you. Now, in the field, like I said at the start, I'm always looking to get the raw file correct. Now, ceilings in particular are very difficult to do that with. It's all about your tripod positioning. But another part of it comes into play when it comes to editing, and that is the radial or graduated filters. Now, to be honest with you, radio I primarily use on all of my work, and that is to draw the viewer's eye into the image, a kind of manual vignette, if you will. You can kind of place it in the center, darken off the edges and draw your viewer's eye in, or off to the left or right or wherever. Here, I'm gonna show you an example using a grad filter. Uh, and with a ceiling, things get frustrating usually. Now, photographing this, exposed with the light, and that then has a nice fall off on the image all the way through the image and shows a kind of bright spot, and then everything else is kind of a little bit darker than that, which isn't beneficial. In fact, what we wanna do is wanna flatten this out as our starting point before we go on and edit it in full. What I've done here is just blended together three images uh, and to give ourselves a nice uh, DNG. We go into develop, and what we can do is we can use the filters here, masking, linear gradient we wanna select. Once we've done that, we can actually pull in from the right-hand side, which is where the darks are, a filter right the way across to the center, then what our aim is here is to change this part. So this is the mask part of our toning. Now be careful that this isn't closed. Mine previously was and I couldn't find it for ages. And of course, if you've got solo mode on, that is gonna be closing all of the time. What we can do is we can actually use this one and actually adjust our exposure and try and get it more balanced with the left side. If your balanced side that you bring up still doesn't kind of match this one, you can then go further down and you could actually come to say your exposure here and that's gonna be your whole exposure. So what we can do is we can bring this up and then what we can do is we can come back here, go back to our filter, bring it down just a smidgen, just a bit, bring up the shadows, highlights, brighten them up and just keep tweaking it. Already we've now got a nice flat canvas where we can pull that together into Photoshop and then do advanced edits on, which is of course for next time. The next one's huge, it is the crop tool. Here I've got an example for you on the screen and I'm gonna give that just a second for you to look at that. Is it nice and straight? Most people would say yes it is. However, if I actually go to develop and go to the crop tool, which is just here of course, the crop overlay, 
you can actually see here that it's actually slightly off. This has all become visible by using the grid overlay and you can get to that by pressing the crop tool and then pressing the letter O key repeatedly to cycle through the different grid overlays. Now some of these overlays will really emphasize the fact that this image is off and you can see that here when we divide the image into four. We'll get to a basic one, this one, and you can see the window is not lined through the middle. And actually we can just pull this in from the left hand side, that's now straighter. If we then press go on that, that would be our final result. So nearly right in camera, brilliant alive in post, exactly as I always say. Now on architecture, three or more of these overlays should work in the context of composition for a good image. So here, go back to the crop overlay and let's check through some of this. So here we've got the triangles. You can see top left working, bottom right working on the staircase. This one works, of course, you've got the banisters. We've got the kind of separation of the kind of lower section of the stairs. It doesn't work so much on the circles, but of course it does on these ones and it does on the squares, which is brilliant. What we can actually do is we can go back to the library and in here I've got some more examples to show you where this crop overlay is kind of like really coming alive and you can see that those crops that I've done have helped a lot. Again, you've got these, uh, the grid section here, you know, your compositional grids. Second one working, third one working. This one is dead in the middle and working. It's actually the lamppost in the center that's not straight. Triangles works. So if I go to another one, this one here, same thing again, we go to the crop tool. Easy as this, you go into the crop, you go through your overlays and you can see here, it works. So if I go to another one, this one here, sometimes you come across like little things that can be improved. When I select five by four, we can actually then pull our crop up into position and put our triangle on the bridge, the other one on the roof of that temple, press go and we've improved our composition. Again here you've got the triangles. We go through this compositional tool and you can see here we are nice and straight, things are good on the windows, but I actually think that when we get to this particular one, the triangle, it works. This one though we could probably um, make things a little bit better. We could actually just bring this down a little bit and kind of meet that step here, if you will. But also we could go a bit further than that because what we could do is we could bring this composition nice and tight. And at this point, a lot of this is working, but you can basically bring this in. And what I'm going to do is make the top of the door frame hit this line. We're also then going to make sure that this one works down the left hand side, down the right. In the left side of the frame, we've now got the vegetation. The right hand corner, we've got this vegetation and grass, the path leading up, press go. We've also now filled the frame with our composition and making it a lot, lot better. Clarity and haze. Now, these are ones that bring alive your architecture shots. The key components, of course, are contrast, shadows, blacks, highlights, clarity, texture and dehaze. Now those last three were added in recent years in Lightroom. It's not a person's face, is it? So you can kind of be quite aggressive with those last three and actually uh, it's quite um, forgiving, let's call it in architecture photography. So in particular, I do use texture quite a lot to bring out texture in brickwork and uh, especially in decayed brickwork. Use clarity, dehaze and texture on sections of the image, not the whole thing. I think that's it for today. So stick around for part two in a couple of weeks time. And of course, just a few days later, part three will follow too. I hope you've enjoyed this introduction. I hope you've taken something away. Please, as I say, leave some comments below. I don't want these views to drop right off because I've done editing. That will demotivate me and mean that you don't get parts two and three. <laughs> I'm only joking. Stick around, those parts will follow. Lots to come on the channel before we head to Sicily next month. See you all soon.